I'm Jason Sylvia, and this is The Creative Capital Show. A show about creative people and how those creative people turn into entrepreneurs by taking their creativity and turning it into a business and facing all the trials and tribulations along the way. Hey everybody, Jason here from Creative Capital Show. Two episodes in, and I've already got bonus content for you. There was so much amazing conversation that happened between myself, Kevin Broccoli, and Tammy Brown on the subject of theater that I really honestly couldn't fit in into one episode. It would have been longer than an average Tarantino movie. So, with that being said, I have about 45 minutes here of raw audio where myself, Tammy, and Kevin, we discuss American perception of theater versus international perception and how we can make local theater better. It's about 45 minutes of straight audio conversation. You won't hear any other interruptions from me until the end of the episode, but I figured such good conversation shouldn't go to waste. And if anything, it should benefit you, the listener. Enjoy. Kevin, I know you wrote an article that had to do with uh, a lot of pay-to-play stuff, but also there was a uh, a note in there about how there are people who were theater-goers and they had this perception that theater was this um, almost like too expensive for them, like a highbrow thing, like them as like an average person, like, oh, I didn't know that there was local theater that wasn't these like insert famous theater in the state X. Um, they didn't realize that theater was affordable, that there were smaller theaters that they could go to. They had, I think they had this like built a perception in their head of like, oh, that's like, almost like that's like a rich person's thing. Um, and I see you and Tammy nodding. So is that the perception of theater and, and why is that? And um, I have some questions after more about just this versus like an international perception. But is that per- is that the perception of theater both locally in the state of Rhode Island? Um, just for those listening, like, you know, we are based in Rhode Island. Uh, I know hopefully this will get to a global audience. But um, is that a Rhode Island thing or is that a, a U.S. thing of like theater is this rich person's like luxury almost and and like it's not available to the common person and why is that well it well it's funny because i think that this actually does tie into and like when tammy talks about it's a lot of different problems you know why i think part of i think diagnosing the problem is understanding that it is um uh anything that deals with racism sexism homophobia whatever also is dealing with classism and with elitism And all of those things are one. It's not a bunch of separate issues. And so um, I've been thinking a lot about um, classism and elitism and the fact that, you know, theater is in many ways not accessible to people. It's why I kind of have had an interesting time doing a lot of digital stuff because digital is super accessible. And I think we can learn something from uh, the fact that digital is accessible. I know for me, I didn't get to go to theater. I didn't get taken to theater when I was a kid. Yeah, that was not something. Yeah. I mean, I used to see the commercials for PPAC on the TV and be like, oh, you know, and I would say to my mom, like, can I go? And, you know, I, she'd be like, well, it's for adults, which I think she really did believe. I think she thought regardless of the show, like it was for adults, it was an adult thing to do. And it really wasn't until like, so, you know, my school would take us to Christmas Carol, like all that stuff, like once a year. But it wasn't until I was a senior in high school and my theater teacher, Mr. the great Mr. Scanlon, said, um, so I'm supposed to make you guys buy this textbook because it was a private school. So we had to buy our own textbooks. He's like, and the textbook is $160. Instead of making you spend $160 on a textbook, at the time, Trinity had um, a student subscription. And for $70, you could see all the plays. You basically had to like call them in so many days and you were going to get the worst seats in the house, but whatever. And it was li- it was 70 bucks, and you got yeah. a season subscription I I got to that Trinity. Yeah. College. And so he's like, don't spend the money on the textbook. Take 70 bucks. But what he said to us that I thought was so interesting was he goes, and I'm not going to hold your hand on this. You have to call them. You have to buy the subscription. I don't care how you get there. Like, you have to figure out when you're going to go. And like, I don't care if you guys want a carpool. You want to do this. You want to do that. But he's like, you know, I consider this your homework. So the same way. I would assign you to, you know, study or whatever. I'm assigning you to go see these plays. And so I bought the subscription. And I remember sitting there seeing the first show that like, and I worked at the time in high school. So like I bought that with my money. Um, And so like I paid for the ticket. 
I showed up. I didn't have my parents with me. It was a real show. It wasn't like a field trip. And I remember thinking, like, I'm not supposed to be here. I literally felt like I don't belong here. I'm not supposed to be here. This is for other people. And I was, at that point, I had been doing theater as a kid. I had done all the drama club in high school and everything. But I remember being like, this is like another world. And so if that's how I felt, I can only imagine how people from lower income backgrounds or people who don't have, who didn't, weren't even interested in the arts, like, I can only imagine, like, Tammy talks about the gatekeeping, how that must feel. Um, and so I think that the way we should think about it is not this thing of, like, we need to, we need to be more welcome, we need to, I think we've done so much harm in terms of accessibility and making people not feel welcome that we need, you know, Isabel Wilkerson in Case talks about radical empathy. I think we need radical accessibility. Like, we need to go out and uh, uh, just very quickly, Trevor, yeah. Trevor Noah tells a story that I love where when he started working on The Daily Show, he really wanted black writers in the writer's room. And so he put out um, a call, whatever. He said, we're auditioning writers and we really, 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 really want black writers. And none showed up. And he was furious because he felt like he had stuck his neck out and said, like, I want to hire black writers. And none showed up. So he goes to this comedy club in New York where he knows there's a bunch of black comedians and he sees them all sitting at a table. And he walks up and goes, guys, what the hell? I, I stuck my neck out. I said I wanted, I made them go to and put, and you guys didn't show up. Why didn't you show up? And they said, because they always say they want black writers and then they never hire us. So mm -hmm. why would we even bother anymore? Like we didn't know yes. that this time was the time we were actually going to get hired because every other time it hasn't been. So we just don't even bother anymore. So it was like a like a boy who cried wolf situation. Yeah, yeah. And he and and the thing is, they kind of knew that Trevor Noah had been hired, but they didn't know that that was going to make a difference. They didn't know, you know, it never made a difference before. And so I think that the only so what Trevor Noah tells that story to say, I should have skipped all of that assum assuming and gone to the comedy club first and just offered them jobs. Yes. And we should have dispensed with this whole: Are you going to show up? Will they show up? Mm -hmm. Cross the fingers. Just go get them. Oh, my God. Yes. Go get the audience. Go get the artists. Like, do not sort of, like, leave a trail of breadcrumbs to the theater. Yes. It doesn't make any sense. Do radical accessibility. Because one of the things that I think I did, too, that was not right, not that it was not right, but it was thinking that it was going to make it, is we did free student tickets. So, like, if you're a student, free student tickets. Okay, it's a lovely idea. But I thought that was all I had to do. I thought, once I make it free... We're not going to have any problems. They're all going to come here. People are going to come here. You know, students from all walks of life are going to come to Epic because now the tickets are free. Well, what I didn't consider was like, how the hell were they even supposed to know where I was? How were they supposed to know that the tickets were free? Um, you know, my teacher told me, you have to figure it out and get there. But I was lucky. I had a mom who could bring me downtown. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I was lucky in that sense. Not everybody has that. Some people have to work. Some kids, students have to work on weekends. And so I didn't want to, like, do the work of following through on that. It was a nice idea, you know, but it didn't achieve what I wanted it to achieve because I thought that money was the only barrier, and it's not. Money's not the only barrier. There are so many other barriers. Tammy, I see you nodding, so agree or, or maybe, like, a difference in the details or? This is absolutely 100%. This is the work we have to do. As theater makers, as theater practitioners, as theater administrators, we have to do that work. And I think that's part of why the um, inclusivity um, problem hasn't been solved yet is because we don't want to do that work. Um, when we did the 24-hour play festival um, yesterday, um, I was in charge. I was artistic directing the festival. And so I was basically in charge of getting the crew together and it was the most diverse writer's room we've ever had and that was because I just went to people that I knew were smart and I said do you want to write and they said yes that's what you have to do you can't just put out a blanket like invitation and say I hope I hope people come but like I don't personally I don't mind that reaching out individually person to person yeah um, I reached out to Kevin and I was like do you know any black writers yeah. send them my way like anybody, like, come on, come on, come on. And like everybody you said, I either had already talked to or I messaged them. That's what, that's the work. 
And I think that's part of why um, some theaters are slow to make this pivot because they don't want to do the work because they haven't had to. If you're the, the gam, let's just say, what the hell? Why not say it? If you're them, you don't normally have to do that work. You just put out an audition notice and 300 people want, you know, 50 slots and it's fine. You don't have to do any work. You just have to sit and watch the auditions. But if 300 people sign up and 50 people, you know, get the actual slots and they're all white kind of basic people, you have to say to yourself, this is not okay. I have to then do the work to get more people to come that I want to be representative. So I have a question. Is that a strictly American thing only because I've watched so many documentaries of um, like comedians from like the UK and comedians, you know, and actors and actresses in European countries. And the thing I'll hear pop up more and more is that they were with a small theater company or a small touring company. And you don't, and at least from my perspective. You know what's funny though is I was, I forget where I heard this, but I was listening to, it might have been an interview where um, I talked to someone and they said that they, they and a bunch of actors pre pandemic went to like Romania where there's government funded theater. And they were like, we went there and we saw a show and it was so great. And we went out with the actors after and we were like, this is what we need. We need the government to fund the arts. And the actors went, we completely disagree with you. And they went, what? And they're like, we completely disagree. And they're like, why? They're like, well, because it's not based on whether or not the audience likes what you're doing, we see so much crap here because we get the government funding regardless of if it's good or if it's bad. I was going to say, what's, what's so they were like, you've traveled so internationally. Like, they're not, nobody makes it's, an effort because it's, it's so like, we're going to get that money whether it's we a need good, a new, yeah. we need a new model. Because yeah. you've traveled, yeah. I, I, it's just I to say that if there's no perfect solution yeah. across, I know the pond, one of you've traveled, at, if not both of you have traveled internationally and done theater. Like, is, oh, I is never it, have. I've never. Okay. I wish. So I think maybe it was you. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, not really. But I, I guess like is is the. But I know what of, you mean. In is, England, yeah. it is like yeah. completely different internationally and in European countries well, versus what we got going on here. We definitely. I think there is a more sort of Especially culturally the idea of like theater being luxury too yeah i think there's more happen. of a culturally centered focus on the arts it seems that's my perception yeah. in european countries and in britain like that's like our our most direct like comparison is in britain because we're like we only started having what is quote unquote american theater like the uh, the first quote unquote american musical was oklahoma so that means we have had american musical theater for like 50 years yeah, that's nothing compared to England having Shakespeare and Marlowe. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that has been ingrained in their society. And Tammy knows this because knowing Shakespeare, like Shakespeare's the history of Shakespeare is the history of of poor people seeing theater. Yes. You know, and plays being written for poor people mm-hmm. to, to enjoy theater, not highbrow. It's funny that, you know. Shakespeare now is like, oh, that's the highbrow show. It's like, that's, it was written for the yes. masses. It absolutely hurts my heart whenever people say that, like, Shakespeare is for, you know, the elite or for the people with, like, the education or what have you, or theater in general, that, like you that's say. That's entirely missing the point. It's missing the point. Theater was the art form for the masses. It always had been because it was the thing that you could put on in the town square. It was the thing that, like, churches used to educate the masses on scripture. It was the thing that people like used to make sure that, I don't know, people know about uh, what they needed to know because nobody could read then. And so you had to watch something. You had to watch a show to like get the information. And in terms of the, the business side of it and the accessibility, what I keep saying is because, so theater is so bizarre to me because we're the only business where you could look at a customer buying a chair and say, just so you know, you buying that chair is not enough. Mm-hmm. You have to give me money on top of buying the chair because I can't do what I do with you just buying that chair. And so I do, to some extent, I'm sympathetic because that's also in a lot of ways true, though. Like there is unfortunately not enough of an appetite just from ticket buyers to then pay for everything we need to pay for because of rising costs and everything else. So then we need donors and we need whatever we need grants, we need government funding. And so it's this weird thing. But here's the problem. How are you going to say to somebody who maybe they did scrimp together somehow 80 bucks for them and their wife to see a show? They also had to pay for a babysitter. They also had to buy parking. They had to go to all this trouble. They had to put on. And you're going to look at them and say, well, that's not enough. By the way, that 80 bucks, that, that does barely anything. And people will say that they will look dead in the face of an audience and say that. 
-hmm. And so to me, having grown up in a family business, my father always thought theater was a joke for that very reason. He was like, what kind of business says that selling the thing you're selling is not enough to keep your doors open? He's like, that doesn't work. And what I think the pandemic exposed was that needs that business model needs to change because it's a terrible business model. Well, also, I've noticed like tickets to go to like, um, and they, actually, you know, I, I wonder if I should hold off because th that's another question I have. I want to hold off. Give, give me, give me a second because I, mm -hmm. I want to keep that in the back of your head because there's something I want to talk about a little bit, a little bit later. But something a little bit more pressing that I wanted to ask was, um, more on, you know, so. We're looking at, you know, theater. We're looking at um, all these different things. And there's going to be an edit right here because I just lost my, my friggin' train of thought in my question. So sorry about that. <laughs> oh, all right. We'll edit this out, thankfully. Um, I want to keep that in the back of your head. But I also want to ask, because we're talking about luxury and accessibility and things like that, is Broadway... And you know, it's the it American centric. Mm -mm. Is Broadway still the the taste maker of whether a play is considered like a hit or popular or not? And if so, why 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 is is it is it a story thing? Is it a cultural thing? Why is Broadway, if that is the case, why is it still the taste maker? Or has that changed now? Has that been democratized? Like in other industries where the like the gatekeepers have gone down, and things are a little bit more democratized for a number of reasons. Or is it that's still the case where like Broadway decides if you're on Broadway and it's a hit, then your play is a hit and that's it. Like and they're they're still a gatekeeper. And that, if so, why is that the case? That is such an interesting question. <laughs> I think I think it's a yes and no. Like I know someone once said, like, you know, every time a, one of those late night shows gets a new host, it's like, why is there so much talk about this? Three thousand people watch these shows because it's still it's an institution and it still means something to host the tonight show. To host SNL is a big fucking deal. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter how many people now think SNL, like me, think it's not cool. It's an institution. We grew up with it. It's been around for 40 years. It's a big deal to be on SNL and host SNL. And the same thing as a playwright and as people who do theater, it is a big deal to be on Broadway. It's a big deal to have a show you wrote be on Broadway. It is the most people you will ever get to play to unless you're Beyonce and you play arenas. And so... It, it still means something. I don't think it's perceived as being cool necessarily. And I think one of the super interesting things you're seeing, you're looking at like playwright like Lauren Gunderson, who has never been on Broadway, but is the most produced playwright in the country. Never having been on Broadway. Never even really having that many New York productions. But just by word of mouth, getting her stuff produced all over the country. So I don't necessarily think it's a tastemaker. I think the problem that we have is that the same way we have unimaginative casting, we have cultivated unimaginative audiences. And so they have a rubric for what they think makes a successful show, before they've even seen the show. Just a title, I should say. And that is, was it on Broadway? That's one of their check marks. Did it, was it on Broadway? Now, here's the funny, I wouldn't even say, was it good or did it win a Tony Award? Because I can't tell you the number of times. Let's take Adam's Family, the musical. <clears throat> Opens on Broadway. Um, universally terrible reviews. Nobody I know liked that I saw liked it. Proceeds to get produced all over the country. Now, it's not like we can't Google the reviews and find out that it wasn't received well, but because it made it to Broadway and it's a Broadway musical, it doesn't matter. That's enough to kind of give it that extra push. And so now you'll see producers with certain plays. This just happened with Slave Play. They knew that play was going to lose money on Broadway. But they also knew that it would be hard to get regional theaters to produce it if it wasn't considered like a Broadway play. And so I think there's always going to be that push to get the play there because that's the pinnacle. And also you want a Tony Award. You can't win a Tony Award if you're not on Broadway. You can only that's the only time you get that award. Gotcha. I don't know, if, Tim, if you wanted to speak on that or go into the next thing. I don't know. If no, I think 100% agree. Or... Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I think it's harder for um, th the thing that Kevin said that really like stuck out in my mind is the unimaginative audiences because um, they don't want to see a show they haven't heard of or haven't seen 20 times before. And that's because they've been cultivated like yeah. you cultivate an audience. Yeah. And 
to piggyback on what Tammy was saying, the part of the work that we have to do is accept that we're all, when we come out of this, if if you're a theater that wants to do the work, you, we're all looking at probably five to 10 years of dramatically shifting the audiences that you bring into your theater and the mm -hmm. audiences you cultivate. So, so I, I like how you ended that with dramatic shift because speaking of dramatic shifts, two things, and I think COVID bought this out more than anything else, or at least bought these questions to my attention. And I'm, and I'm going to admit, I'm not like this person that's super into theater. I'm into theater because I know you both and I've gone and I've been lucky enough to be, be exposed to it. Um, first thing, and I was alluding to this a little earlier when I said, keep that thought in your yeah. head. Um, you know, theater tickets, at least public perception, right? You're paying X amount of money, and usually, at least from what I've seen, I've been more expensive than like movie tickets. And the reason mm -hmm. why I'm bringing uh -huh. that up, the reason why I'm bringing that up is, um, with all these forms of entertainment, right? Movies, video games. I can go stream something. I got free content to stream. I got free this. Um, can theater compete with other forms of entertainment? Yes or no. And does it or does it have to change to compete? And if so, how should it change? Well, like as you this is like the age old question, right? Like, um, I don't know if it was you, Kevin, that has said this previously, like in prior conversations. But like. As long as I've been doing theater, the whole thing is like theater's dead. It's dying. <laughs> it's going to die. We're going to be the last generation that ever does theater. Meanwhile, theater has been like one of the oldest forms of artistic expression and it's been done for thousands of years so i doubt that we would be the generation to end it but it's still a question right like because i mean back in the day theater was the only thing so like it, it wasn't competing with instagram and youtube and everything else but as you list off those things and i think especially now during the pandemic it's become so much more um clear and kind of front of mind how unique theater is in comparison to other forms of um, entertainment and expression and um, consumption, theater requires you to be in the room with people and it requires you to connect with people. It requires you to like breathe the same air and experience the same particular moment in time. And I think that is something that we as a society that is becoming more and more technologically advanced um, are sort of losing a sense of I think that's true. We don't all consume the same thing. Like, you know, even 20 or 30 years ago, there would be, you know, the final episode of a particular show and like everybody would have to watch it. Everybody would have to go into their living room at 8 p.m. on a Thursday night to watch like the last episode of Seinfeld because that's the only time you could see it. And there's nothing like that now. But it's still a really special um electric thing about theater and so i think to me during the pandemic we have to make people realize that we're here and that we're still kind of relevant and that we're still producing things that are interesting to people but when we come out of it we have to emphasize the uniqueness that theater is and i think people i hope people will be really kind of itching for that person-to-person -person connection because we wouldn't have had it for so long and so hopefully people will be willing to try something out that's an entertainment form that requires you to be in the same room with somebody i don't i mean what i think is interesting is nobody i haven't heard anyone say are we worried that when this is all over and taylor swift goes on tour nobody's going to buy tickets mm -hmm. or are we worried that when beyonce goes on tour nobody's going to want to see beyonce and to me it's weird because there i don't see a huge difference between concerts and theater to me concerts are a form of theater and we kind of understand that like, well, no, those people are never going to have to worry because like, can you imagine, can you imagine Beyonce announcing a tour and like her and Jay-Z going out and no one showing up? No, we can't imagine it. But something about theater, we think, but that might be not as urgent or not as whatever. So, I mean, one thing we can take from that is, well, let's look at what Beyonce is doing on her concerts and see what we can integrate there. Mm -hmm. But I think what we also have to remember is it's because like when this pandemic started, I was thinking along the lines. I was like, look, we were already having such a hard time. And Tammy can speak to this. The hardest thing is getting people in the room. It's the hardest, hardest thing is just getting people to show up. It's so hard. And I thought, well, we're about to lose this war because now people have to stay home and we're going to lose the war. We were already losing the war. We were competing against Netflix. We're competing against Hulu. We're fucked. 
And what was interesting was a couple months in, I felt that people missed it. Mm -hmm. I could feel people being like, I cannot watch one more thing on Netflix. I cannot watch one more thing on Hulu. I want to be around people. I want that. And so I almost think it's like absence makes the heart grow fonder. I think we could make a really good case right now for theater being vital. Yeah. But I think for me, part of the case would be there just isn't, you can't equate the difference between sitting at home, even if you invite people over and we you fill the apartment up or whatever. It is just not the same thing as going out. And we talked about that experience, right? Like, because it becomes, theater becomes part of an experience. You can't even begin to imagine what not having theater is doing to hurt these restaurants. We're talking about restaurants hurting, but mm -hmm. no one's talking about the fact that when my theater's open, it helps the restaurant next to yeah. me. It's all one thing. And so um, I think we can definitely improve and make those experiences better. If it were up to me, every proscenium theater in the country would be redesigned because we don't need that we don't gap need anymore. Yeah. Um, but I think that in terms of the value of being out, I don't even miss really. I can't even tell you there's a show right now specifically I want to see, but I want to be in a room. I want to bump into Tammy at a show in the audience say, oh, Tammy, can I sit next to you? Yeah, come sit here. And then we like gossip a little mm -hmm. bit. And then the show happens and maybe it's bad. Maybe it's the worst show we've ever seen. But then we like, hey, do you want to go to Frisky Fries? And then we go, there's a whole list of things that happens that where theater is a part of it and it's a crucial part of it. But also like, I've rarely ever seen a movie that I went home and I was like, God, that movie was great. I want to have sex right now. Mm -hmm. Like good theater, it like revs your ass up. Yeah. It really does in a way that, and we should honestly put that on the posters to sell theater. We should yes. be like, you are going to want to bang good, after yeah, this. Yeah, good show. theater, the aphrodisiac. Like, it's true, though. It does, like, it energizes it's you. It's true. You go Absolutely. see a good play, like, you are, you can tell when a friend, when you've seen a friend walk in a bar after they've either been in a show or just seen a show that they love, mm -hmm. or even if they hated it, they walk in different. It's yeah. just not the same from anything else. So, so speaking about the live experience and saying, like, it's got to be live, it, I think it perfectly leads to my next question, which is, um, and Tammy, you and I have talked about this uh, just in random conversation, but I definitely want to get both of your opinion on this, especially with COVID. Um, are there things in theater, things that can translate into the digital realm? Because Kevin, I want and I want mm. definitely want to get your opinion on because you've done the show Amateurs, which was the YouTube show, and I'm sad you didn't keep doing it because I thought it was hilarious. But are there things I where to die. because well <laughs> Not because many of you just film in general be, because well because. <laughs> You know, we have things like YouTube, we have things like even TikTok and Instagram, and we have social media. What has, you know, as far as in terms of the digital world and the digital revolution, have there, it's democratized other things like film and the music industry. Has it democratized certain things in theater? Yes or no. And can certain things in theater maybe use digital as a like a marketing or promotions or if not like ways to show off skills like what's stopping somebody from maybe doing a monologue on tiktok or instagram and getting discovered i guess it's just a weird example but i just want want your opinions on that of just using digital as a tool whether it's marketing creatively or even doing a, a play that's set within the realm of a zoom call We'll see movies that have done yeah. that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm just and curious. Tammy's just coming off CTC's 24-hour play festival that just went all digital. And I think we were talking before we started recording about like how much how much I think they're like, well, just as a, a viewer, I was like, oh, I wish they would keep like 50% mm -hmm. of some of this. Yeah. I want it back in person. I don't want it yeah. to remain digital. But it was crazy to see just how much of it people got so engaged and excited about. And what might have probably to them at first felt like uh, a consolation mm -hmm. event, actually, I think was probably one of their best times that they've done it. Well, yeah. well even pre-pandemic, too, not to cut you off, like, I remember Showcase Theaters in Providence, they had, like, pre-pandemic had certain shows that were in New York that were either ballet or theater that yeah. you could yeah. pay, like, ten dollars and see it on a big screen and be in it with a live audience but you just weren't there in new york yeah. and even mm -hmm. that was like a more or even like ride. i think the dnc was the best dnc they've ever done this year mm -hmm. because normally it's a pep rally what is dnc just so a democratic know? national convention okay, okay so like normally it's I a didn't bunch know if it was a theater yeah. thing or if you were talking yeah. political normally i can't watch that stuff because i can't stand a speech that's broken up 17 times by applause and so to me to have it all digital and just listen to people and then you have all that extra time have normal people talk because you're not cut you're not like saving time on applause 
I was like, I would watch this again before I would watch. I don't think you should go back personally. So I think there are certain things. I actually, I'll be crazy. I think some of these award shows are better like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's better when everyone's in the room, but I don't necessarily miss the cutaways to like, you know, Jack Nicholson in the front row, yeah. like react shotting. Well, well, you did Amateurs, which is a YouTube show, and it made me want to go see more stuff in the theater because it, it introduced. Well, unfortunately, you were one of the few, but thank you. You weren't <laughs> one of the few who watched, but you were one of the. That was the idea. Was but I, I gotta admit, it wasn't heavily promoted though. Like, like I was telling friends about, it, and they're like, "Oh shit, I, I wish know I what knew the about hell? This. What did you want to take out a billboard on Smith Street? I didn't <laughs> know. I, I, I'm the king of Tim. He was talking about people who want to like do the least and expect the most. Like, I'm the king of like. You know, we we filmed a web series. Now everybody needs to just find it and like it needs to organically <laughs> take off. And yeah, I mean, that was um, yeah, that was I, I just don't lend myself to film, but specifically to like uh, like digital theater, um, what I've thought about. So I'm a big proponent of hiring local. And so I say this only with the caveat that like I would want this kind of thing to happen after every local person has found a project. I don't see the reason we couldn't have like uh, I could do a show in Rhode Island and my dramaturg could be from Pennsylvania. I don't see why maybe as we as the technology develops even further, I don't see why Tammy couldn't uh, uh, direct a show in Dallas, mm -hmm. you know, and have her on the screen. It's, not, you know, yes, there are times where a director needs to get up on stage and show you something. Yeah. But I think like if it opens the door to like there's a small company in Dallas that really needs an experienced director, but there's nobody in their community or they want a black director. They're yeah. like, we want to work with a black director. And Tammy's like, I can go do it. I think it would be, that would be a cool situation to make happen and, and make it work. And so I hope what it does is it globalizes us a little bit more. But like I said, I also don't want it to then, we already have a problem with local people getting passed over for people outside. So, so Tammy, I know you did that, the 24 hour play festival digital. What was that experience like? And do you think that digital revolution is going to help or do you think that those ways haven't been fully realized and utilized yet as far as the relationship between digital and theater and i think that as um theater makers we've kind of in order to we have to like adventure into the digital realm right now because otherwise we just wouldn't be producing anything and so we have to stay in people's minds and we have to stay connected to our community like at ctc we're all about like connection to the community and to our ensemble and so people were really wanting to connect back with us and we didn't have a method for them to do that really and so that 24-hour play festival that we did just now was um we have a, a festival where writers come and write throughout the night and then actors and directors come and rehearse it through the day and then we perform the show at night and we do that every year we've done it for 15 years and then this year, we couldn't do that in person, so we did it digitally. But at the same time, I thought, so in planning it, I thought, like, you know, we could do that, and we could do that digitally. But to me, as an audience member, that's not quite enough because it doesn't, it doesn't um, it encompass sort of what all goes into the 24-hour play festival. It's a lesser version of the thing, lesser, yeah. It becomes a lesser version of the thing. So I said, let's up the ante and make it a bigger version of the thing by making it also, since we're doing a digital format, make it also a 24-hour straight live stream where we're checking in live with people who are working on the play currently, but we're also doing a sort of retrospective time of all the past 15 years that we've done it. And people really liked it, it seems. I don't know. It was just yesterday. <laughs> so it seems like people liked it. People liked it, yeah. But... um. I think what that does is it forces you as a theater artist to sort of expand your creativity and say, okay, what skills do I bring and how can we adapt this to the digital realm? Because what we ended up with was five, six short plays that were then written for Zoom and were performed on Zoom. And they um, we had digital background art, like artists, creators who were each assigned and they were creating live backgrounds for the people and so it was a a different sort of creative outlet and when you see the final result it was great i love the plays that, that we came up with so i think it's a matter of sort of pushing ourselves to adapt to the digital format but at the same time we call them plays but what's the difference between that and a short film i don't know and so we're still theater artists. It's still theater is a live 
medium is still something that is about people connecting in space, but also what what does it what can we take from this moment and bring it into when we come back in person so that it still feels like a relevant art form in the 21st century. So I think uh, we're, we're getting we're getting towards the end. Um, and I definitely want to kind of bring it back to local theater. Um, and I know Kevin, you wrote about this, about not having uh, an issue with press, like local press coverage on local arts theater. writers. Yeah. Um, so it's a multi-part question, but what is your perception of um, both your perceptions on local theater here in Rhode Island? Um, and what can you be think can be done, not just Rhode Island local theater, but local theater in general, as far as what do you think more can be done from an audience perspective, from the theater's perspective, and then from the greater, you know, creative community, creative community, like when it comes to like journalists and writers and musicians, like what can be done to make local theater better and more accessible on like the local level? Yeah. Well, the the arts writing is uh, absolutely in the garbage. Um, <laughs> like, I mean, is that just Rhode Island, or you think that's just? Oh, like, I mean, I don't problem, know. Like, I, like everywhere. Well, I get the sense that it's not. Um, I actually am a, uh, have discovered through the pandemic this um really great theater in Needham, Arkellian Theater, and they did a digital show that was so successful. The New York Times did a spotlight critics pick of the show, and they could not get their hometown paper, the Boston Globe, to go review it. Wait, the, so the New York Times was like, yo, this is awesome, but the hometown the Boston, Boston Globe, Globe was didn't like, want, we're not going to cover this. They didn't want to want to cover it, yeah, um, which is the kind of backwards nonsense that I'm not, I didn't, didn't even phase me when I found that out. I mean, like, it's a good example, mm-hmm. but it didn't phase me because, I mean, I've been in the New York Times four times and, like, uh, didn't always get coverage for the things that I was in the New York Times for. Um, when I, uh, when the whole dust up with, like, Franco happened. I still think it's ridiculous that Trinity Rep didn't call and say, how do we get this show on for, stage? For people who don't know by Franco, you mean yeah. the, the one and only James Franco? Yeah. So, I mean, I've had numerous times where, like, I had a little bit of a little, like, national press blip. And you would think, I mean, I talk about business. It'd be smart business if someone's having a national moment to, like, piggyback. And I would have instances of, like, other smaller theaters, like, you know, like CTC and other theaters, like, asking to 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 collaborate but not from the bigger theaters if anything i got the sense that there was this sort of like oh like resentment almost because like i wasn't one of theirs and so you know they didn't want to like piggy but whatever but what i'll say is that i think in this community specifically in rhode island i can only speak to rhode island as i said before there's a lot of elitism a lot a lot of elitism and because we have we are in a state, and specifically in Providence, we have a community that has four or five different colleges. I think we've gotten the worst of all worlds with that scenario, because I think everything has become highly academicized, where, um, you know, uh, because let's face it, I mean, like, it's very difficult to go to Brown if you come from a lower income family. It's, you know, it's just, I don't know, that's a whole thing in and of itself. But um, I think, that ultimately we have let academia completely invade the arts. And I'm not talking about intelligence. I'm talking about academics. We have let them invade the arts and make it a very elitist space. Um, and I I think it, that trickles down. I think in general, being a Rhode Islander means not being proud of where you're from and wanting opinions and input from all these other places and valuing things from other places more than stuff here. Um, Kurt knows this because I told him when he first got here when Kurt Columbus first got here to run Trinity Rep the projo did an interview and said what do you think can be fixed about the Rhode Island theater scene why the fuck were they asking him he had been here five minutes why weren't they asking me I grew up here because we do this thing of like we only value you when you go away and come back Um, otherwise you have no worth and so I think that's really affected our art scene um, a lot of the young artists here, they assume they can't stay here and do art or make art. They want to leave. And that's a whole Rhode Island perception. That's not just theater. But uh, I think that it's terrible that we had a pandemic, but we desperately needed a reset. Mm-hmm. So I would not have wished for it under these circumstances. But if I'm being honest, I really don't know how else we would have gotten the reset. I think a lot of people felt like things on every level from Broadway down had gotten wildly out of control. The work that was coming out was below subpar. We had shit like Some Like It Hot the Musical. We're getting an all-white Hugh Jackman music man. 
and the work that was being done locally, including at my theater, was not all that exciting, truthfully. Um, so I think it's kind of exciting that when we come back, we're really going to have to step it up. Um, we can make assumptions as much as we want about when, and I said this last night on The Drag, the interview show that I do, about when artists are ready to come back and when the stage managers and the directors, we have no clue when the audiences are ready to come back. We do not have a direct channel to the audience. So I could decide that September looks good and we could have everybody in the world vaccinated and it's very possible that the audience could go, no, I'm good. So I think what we have to do is think about completely, completely, I mean, to, to really, and I'm being serious when I say this, your show better be a Beyonce concert. Because I just don't know what the point is. And I know for me as an artist, I'm not coming back to do, like, I have really learned throughout this that life is too short. So I'm not coming back to phone it in. It just doesn't, I'll sit, I'll sit out. Um, and I think that's what everybody needs to think of. And I only say that because, again, talking to some of the people locally about what they're thinking of doing, it sounds like they just think we're going to go back to two years ago. And it's just not going to work. And it's not the promise that we made. We said we were going to drastically change what we put on stage. And um, I'm not smart enough or innovative enough necessarily to be the one to be like, I think the new theater should look like this. <laughs> like, I'm not. And, and I'm also not the one who necessarily should be asked about it because we need to give people who haven't had a voice in all that a chance to talk about it. But I do think it needs to be a complete and total. I would, if I had to err on one side or the other, burn it all to the ground and start over. Yeah, I mean, I think that we have to, you know, it. the idea, like, theater is what it is. It's it's an analog art form. It's not digital. Theater is not digital. It's just not. So when we come back, we have to then figure out what can we do in this analog art form that still makes it feel current in 2021 and 2022 and 2023 and beyond. And I think there are a lot of artistic leaders who aren't that interested in doing that. And, you know, I think, I think, like Kevin said, I think the pandemic is going to show what, like, if you're not willing to evolve and move forward, that's going to be really apparent. And I think the theater is like an, ad an adapt or die kind of thing. Yeah. The theaters that come out of this and can come back stronger are going to be the ones that are the innovative spaces and the ones that bring, I've always been a proponent of taking theater out of like the theater and bringing it to the people in a different way, but it's still in person. It's still, but also maybe streamed but also so that it can reach, but also connecting real life person to person. I think we have to think differently about reaching new audiences and making things feel relevant to people who haven't thought that theater is an art form for them. It's always been an important thing, but I think it's even more important now than ever. It's funny because I was listening to the Angel podcast. Um, I was listening to the Trixie and Katya podcast and they were talking about how um, on comedy sets for movies and TV, they blast the air conditioning. They want it like 30 degrees. And someone was like, well, why do they do that? And they're like, because if it, if an audience is warm and comfortable, they don't laugh. Because they're, cause they might enjoy it. They might enjoy what they're seeing, but they're not like in the position. They're not just uncomfortable enough to really be paying attention enough to get the joke, to make the laugh. And I thought that was so interesting. The idea that like, you know, we don't want to torture them. We're not trying to freeze them to death, but we do need to make conditions so that they're really paying attention. And I think of like the best things I've seen, like I saw this play off Broadway at the public called Here Lies Love, a musical. And it was a, a disco musical about a Mil de Marcos. And so you walked in and you were in a club. And then all of a sudden the musical just starts happening around you. And then they're moving you around and you're sitting on stairs and you're getting up and you're dancing, whatever. And everybody walked out. Now, truthfully, I don't know if it was that good of a show. Like if I really like if I read this libretto and listened to the music, I don't know. But like, oh, my God, I had the time of my life. I'll never forget it. Hmm. And I couldn't not pay attention. You couldn't not pay attention because you never is. knew what was coming at you. So, you know, the idea that like, so many theaters before the pandemic were starting capital campaigns to put in like even plushier seats. It's like, make them sit on benches. Mm -hmm. We need them awake. You know, I mean, I'll fall asleep on a good day. So like, you're gonna, like <laughs> the creative capital show is hosted 
recorded, edited, mixed, and produced by me, Jason Silva. You can listen to The Creative Capital Show over at our website, creativecapitalshow.com. We're also available on Anchor FM, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, and all other major podcast hosting platforms. If you like the show, please subscribe. Helps the show out a lot. And be sure to follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, LinkedIn, and YouTube. I hope you enjoyed the show, and until next time, keep on creating.